Needless to say, it's epidemic in our society. Uh, lung cancer has overtaken breast cancer, for example, as the leading cause of cancer death in women. I think that we've evolved quite a bit in the past six or seven years in radiologic assessment of lung cancer. I'd like to share my perspective uh, with you. As most of you know, there has been a new lung cancer staging system developed the key focus of which to distinguish resectable from non-resectable disease. And the underlying reason that this has occurred is that some surgeons at least are becoming much more aggressive in their management of lung cancer patient in that surgery offers the only real potential for cure. What this staging system has done is resulted in the addition of a T4 in the TNM categorization, so T standing for tumor, and N3 the nodal category. Uh, and I'd like to just point out very briefly what the uh, Rankinologic correlates will be. Here at the Ford, there had only been a T3 category, and T4 has been added, whereas previously T3 was any tumor with direct extension into the chest wall without involvement of heart, great vessels, trachea, esophagus, or vertebral body. T4 has now been added on and it is invasion of mediastinum involving these structures. The implication being that if there is invasion of heart, great vessels, trachea, carina, esophagus, or vertebral body, that tumor will be non-resectable. On the other hand, if it's just local invasion into structures that are resectable, such as ribs, uh, chest wall fat, mediastinal pleura, that tumor is potentially resectable. One other change that I mentioned there's been controversy for really decades as to which mediastinal nodes connote inoperable disease. I'd say we still don't have a very good answer today. I'm hopeful that in five or 10 years we will have a much better answer, but some surgeons are now operating on patients with proven metastatic disease to particularly low ipsilateral mediastinal nodes. On the other hand, there is not a surgeon that I'm aware of that is operating on patients with proven metastatic disease to contralateral mediastinal, contralateral hilar lymph nodes, scalene or supraclavicular nodes. So this category, indisputably inoperable, that's called N3, less extensive disease with mediastinal uh, metastasis N2. So those are some new changes in the staging. I think we ought to follow that with interest. I think this question is particularly important I don't really expect a definitive answer for a considerable number of years. Now turning to our assessment of the lung cancer patient, uh, despite the fact that there is some controversy now as to which positive mediastinal nodes connote inoperability, uh, still our attention has to be turned to the mediastinum. And I think that one key point is that we do better with the tomographic studies, the cross-sectional tomographic studies, CT and MR, then with either conventional tomography or conventional chest radiography in the assessment of the mediastinum. Uh, however, it's still a bit of controversy as to how sensitive we are in detection of mediastinal disease. I think these two slides should be very important as a take-home message because what we do in our assessment of the lung cancer patient is to direct the surgeon to that site in the mediastinum at which there's the highest likelihood of disease. And then depending upon local preferences, the surgeon will either operate or not operate depending upon the findings. Uh, this is the most important slide. It's incumbent upon us to know which lymph nodes in the mediastinum are inaccessible via mediastinoscopy. And there are four groups that are inaccessible. All other nodal chains are accessible to the mediastinoscope. Those that are inaccessible include any anterior mediastinal node, any AP window lymph node, posterior subcarinal nodes, and paraesophageal nodes. I will say as a brief digression, I think at times these nodes are often called subcarinal nodes, which is a mistake because as you can see here, anterior subcarinal nodes are accessible to the mediastinoscope. Uh, one, uh, take home message, any node that's less than two centimeters caudal to the carina is paraesophageal and is not subcarinal in location. 
Okay, the mediastinoscope is inserted in the pretracheal fascia uh, substernally, and here is the plane in which it passes. So looking at the pathological section on your right, the mediastinoscope would pass in this plane, could then sample each of these uh, paratracheal nodes. These nodes were positive uh, for cancer. On the other hand, the mediastinoscope could not sample this anterior mediastinal node, and if this were the only node present in the patient, it would require a parasternal mediastinotomy for sampling. One other recapitulation of this applied anatomy here at the plane where the azagous vein enters the posterior aspect of the superior vena cava, a normal pretracheal node in the mediastinoscope passes in this plane and so would be able easily to sample this large mediastinal node. But it's important to note, even, these, even though these nodes here look tantalizingly close to this, these are AP window nodes and cannot be sampled at mediastinoscopy. If they were enlarged, they're not in this case, but if they were, it would require mediastinotomy for sampling. And this is of great importance as we guide the surgical intervention in lung cancer. I sort of have lost track of the literature in terms of how many studies exist comparing CT, MR, conventional radiography and tomography in the lung cancer patient, attempting to answer the question, how good are we in assessing the mediastinum? Suffice it to say that you can pick out from this data uh, any point of view you'd wish you would wish to hold, saying either that CT is fairly poor in assessing mediastinal nodes in lung cancer, or CT is terrific. Now, what are the differences? I'll go through it briefly, but much of the data that's particularly cited by our internal medicine colleagues, they tend to lump all the data and throw this into review articles in places like the Annals of Internal Medicine and reach conclusions that I personally don't agree with, but some of this used second-generation scanners, and that data should really be relegated to history. Also, a couple of these studies that are very widely quoted in the thoracic surgery and internal medicine literature use technical factor, factors, section spacing, section thickness that are inappropriate in a lung cancer patient. Uh, this particular one, 25 millimeter spacing, 13 millimeter thickness. So half the mediastinum was never imaged. And David has made the very good point, if you want to do better, well, thinner sections are better. What do I think is reasonable? In the lung cancer patient, I'm happy with contiguous eight to 10 millimeter thick sections. I think, though, that with technological improvements in the scanners that make it feasible to do an exam in a timely fashion that we can all live with on the scanner, it's very likely we will be imaging lung cancer patients with five millimeter thick contiguous sections. Uh, one other point, our group did this work back in 1983 in Ann Arbor. Many of these studies that talked about the use of CT in staging lung cancer never defined the size criterion for deciding when a node was big or not big. We did an ROC curve analysis I'll just briefly state it that I think that a uniform size criteria of 10 millimeters in the shortest axis of the node that you can measure is a reasonable cut point to call a node normal or abnormal. Um, do I measure all the nodes in practice? No, you, you get a pretty good eye for things, but if you're going to put a number on it, I think the 10 millimeter in shortest axis number is a good one to use. Now, it's important to point out, and a number of authors have done this, that no matter what size criterion or criteria one uses, there will be errors. And here are two errors that are insurmountable with the CT technique. This patient has a right lower lobe lung cancer, you can see. There is an enlarged posterior subcarinal node. This node was enlarged at thoracotomy. It was enlarged at pathological measurement, but this node contained only reactive hyperplasia, so CT false positive. And what is the frequency of this? Depends upon your patient population, what the prevalence is of, uh, oh, debris one breathes in, granulomatous disease, etc. But it's probably, of every three nodes in my own practice that I call enlarged in the lung cancer patient, roughly two will contain cancer, one will be tumor free. Now, this is the flip side. I'm not illustrating the primary lung cancer, but this subcarinal node, unequivocally normal at CT. Here is the short axis. This would be the long axis, and short axis, it was, it was seven millimeters. It was normal at surgical inspection, but this node contained tumor. So 
tumor in normal size node. Now, I think one might ask, looking at the different studies, uh, how much difference has it made that some surgeons are more thorough in dissecting the mediastinum? I think uh, Professor Lipschitz called our attention to it first and said, well, maybe the problem is that in this data that reported very positive results that the surgeons were not exploring the mediastinum very carefully and so didn't pluck out these very small nodes containing micrometastases. Uh, and so these were missed because so-called total nodal sampling is not being performed. First of all, total nodal sampling is a misnomer. The actual, the human mediastinum actually contains about 55, 60 lymph nodes. There's no surgeon alive that I know of that totally strips out each node in the mediastinum that would require bilateral thoracotomies, which is not done, at least in this country. But it's a good point. That I would like to say, though, if this were the total explanation for the difference in results, then the prevalence of mediastinal metastasis in the series with low sensitivity ought to be the highest. Yet, as you can see, it's amongst the lowest reported in staging the lung cancer patient. So I don't think this is the explanation. I think the real explanation relates to patient selection. As you read through the literature, what is the prevalence of mediastinal metastasis in unselected series or large series of patients with lung cancer? It's about 40 to 45 percent. As David said, patients present in general with fairly advanced disease. I think it's very important to point out that one needs to distinguish between low sensitivity for metastasis detection on a lymph node by lymph node basis versus low sensitivity on a patient by patient basis. Up until this point in time, there never has been any real value in distinguishing whether any individual node did or did not contain tumor. Or the real question, did the patient's mediastinum contain tumor? and that if one, result, if one reports results on a node-by-node -node basis, one will get quite different results than a patient-by-patient -patient basis. While I was still at Michigan, myself, Barry Gross, uh, some of our colleagues, Mark Oringer, the surgeon, carried out a prospective lung cancer study. And indeed, we find that if you try to use the one centimeter size cutoff, to determine whether a node is normal or abnormal on CT, the sensitivity is only 33%. On the other hand, if you take the data and use the data in an individual patient for the largest node, the sensitivity of CT jumps up to 73%. Furthermore, and this is most important, only three of 42 patients in this prospective study had metastases limited to nodes which were normal at CT. So I don't think we're doing our patients a disservice by missing uh, metastases to normal size nodes because, again, in most patients there will be at least one node, the largest one, which can be detected at CT, usually is enlarged because it contains tumors. I'd like to go on and say even if we miss micrometastases to normal size nodes, is this really important in the patient? Are we doing our patients a disservice? Well, there is some data that indicates that micrometastases to normal size nodes does not have the same surgical significance as metastatic disease involving enlarged lymph nodes. And here is some of that data. All these patients, this is back before there was an N3 grouping, but there are positive mediastinal nodes in which the positive nodes were determined at mediastinoscopy. Another group of patients with positive mediastinal nodes in which their nodal status was determined only at thoracotomy, and in general, this followed a negative mediastinoscopy. Note a much better five-year survival in these patients. So it makes a difference whether your positive nodes were determined at mediastinoscopy, miserable five-year survival, or only at thoracotomy, a reasonable five-year survival. Now, what's the difference? There are a few explanations, but I think the likeliest explanation that explains these results is that mediastinoscopy is a very, very crude test. If I could have gotten a picture from mediastinoscopy, it would have looked even worse than what David showed you at bronchoscopy. This is a rigid tube that has a very small opening, uh, and I believe that what that samples in general is bulk disease. And so that if what we're missing at CT are the same nodes that are, tend to be missed at mediastinoscopy. Again, this patient group probably has better survival. 
I think one might ask, can we do better, either in terms of sensitivity or specificity, by defining more precise criteria for lymph node enlargement, which reflect the precise anatomic location of the node? Anatomists, surgeons have known for over a century that lymph node size varies as a function of lymph node location. And although I mentioned this 10 millimeter size cutoff, indeed, if I see a node of eight millimeters in regions in the upper paratracheal regions, either on the right or the left, I'm very suspicious in that particular node because these nodes tend to be the smallest in the mediastinum. On the other hand, about the subcarinal region and in region 10R, the nodes tend to be big. So I give a little bit there, and I'd say 10, 11 millimeters is a reasonable cutoff in the subcarinal and tracheobronchial region. The French has pub have published some literature that defines this more clearly, and I think we should get some definitive data on this in the next few years. Now, I'd like to move outside of the mediastinum to the chest wall. If all cases were like this, it would be no problem, but that's not usually the case. One of these two patients has chest wall involvement, one does not. As I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the talk, in a sense, it doesn't make that much difference if you can define which of the two patients does or does not have chest wall involvement because both will be candidates for pulmonary resection with on-block resection of the chest wall. The problem is that procedure carries quite a bit of morbidity and indeed mortality to the patient, and it would be very useful if we could tell the thoracic surgeons which patient does indeed have chest wall uh, invasion. Uh, suffice it to say, I don't think we do this very accurately. It turns out this patient had chest wall invasion. This patient did not. The criterion that I think you ought to use because it's very sensitive, albeit nonspecific, is pleural thickening. If you see pleural thickening, you should alert the thoracic surgeon to the possibility that there may be chest wall invasion, knowing that you're going to be wrong more often than right because most patients will just, in that setting, just have adhesions. Now, I'd like to move on to the upper abdomen because CT of the upper abdomen, in my opinion, is essential in staging the lung cancer patient. The rationale is as follows. In autopsies performed within 30 days of a curative resection, so all tumor was indeed removed from the chest, but the patient died from things like myocardial infarction, stroke. There was a 20 to 25 percent incidence of extrathoracic metastatic disease. Interestingly, most of this disease was single organ, majority in the liver or the adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland has gotten a lot of play in the lung cancer patient, but in this initial work, there was actually more metastatic disease in the liver than the adrenal gland. And I think it's important to comment about the technique here. If you're going to give all your contrast up in the chest, scan dynamically through the chest, and then scan through the liver, you're going to end up scanning the liver during an equilibrium phase of contrast enhancement. And you may make metastases isodense. So that I think you either ought to do your liver as part of the examination before you image the chest, before you reach the e equilibrium stage, or as we do, we still work from top to bottom, but we give a second bolus at the dome of the liver, and you can find little things like this. Now, I mentioned yesterday about adrenal masses. In the lung cancer patient, if you take all comers with adrenal masses, the minority are metastatic lesions, the majority are benign adenomas or nodular hyperplasia. As you know, using lesion size, shape, internal attenuation, it's nonspecific. You cannot tell for certain whether you're dealing with a, an adenoma or a metastatic deposit. This will be the most accurate test in making that assessment, the NP59 scintigraphy, as I showed you yesterday. The problem is it's sort of an orphan drug right now, not widely available, but I'm hopeful that it will become more fully developed. Here's an example, patient with a lung cancer, big left adrenal mass, about four centimeters, hot spot over the left adrenal gland, as I showed yesterday, functioning adrenal tissue. This will not be a metastatic deposit, and indeed it wasn't in this case. When I was at Michigan, in cases like this, we ended up not biopsying the gland. We had enough experience to be confident that we were going to reach an unequivocal diagnosis. I'd like to turn now to MR. A fair number of articles, quite a bit of interest in utilizing MR to stage lung cancer. Here are some of the advantages as written in the literature. MR perhaps a bit better, chest wall invasion, superior sulcus tumors, some data that it's a little better in looking at AP window nodes, 
Some believe it's slightly better in evaluating hyalur nodes. I won't cover this. I don't think there's much to choose from. Now, in terms of chest wall invasion, I'll first point out some problems with MR. And one problem is if you only had the MR to look at, since the rib margins are poorly visualized, the boundary of the chest wall can be very difficult to determine on MRI. Uh, pleural thickening will be nonspecific for both modalities. Now, if this were the only study that you had, I think it'd be tough to see what's going on in the apex. Here, there's no problem. And again, sometimes the rib margins can be very difficult to identify, and if this were the only data that you had, I think there'd be some problems. Now, here's where MR does have perhaps some benefit. I think the chest wall invasion is visible on the CT. It would take a pretty good eye, perhaps, to find it. Here is a STIR MR image, the short T1 inversion recovery that nulls the fat out. You can see anterior to the sternum, some tumor in the chest wall. Here, note the asymmetry here, but this is one minor advantage of the MR technique. Superior sulcus tumors, I think that the major advantage is really to the surgeon, not to the radiologist. The surgeon seems to like the coronal display of information, and perhaps it gives some uh, useful information in terms of shortening surgical procedures. I'm not really sure about that. Um, AP window nodes in the study that we did that was fairly rigorous, we really didn't find an advantage to MR compared to CT. Here's the type of study, though, that has been alluded to as, making, as showing that MR may have some value. I'll leave it to you to decide whether there is AP window uh, lymphadenopathy or not. I think it's relatively clear cut here, the big peripheral malignancy in this slide, try to decide for yourself. And I think that perhaps it is a little bit clearer on the MR than the CT because of the different plane of imaging that yes, this peripheral tumor has extended to a node in the AP window. Again, we didn't really show any significant advantage to MR compared to CT in a fairly rigorous study. Now turning to the pulmonary parenchyma, MR at the current point in time is considerably inferior to CT in detecting smaller parenchymal abnormalities. Now this may be of importance in the lung cancer patient because of an inability to reliably identify both metastatic nodules and second primary neoplasms. Here's an example and perhaps the abnormality is evident even on the chest x-ray. Uh, clearly a right hilar mass, clearly a mass up here in the right apex I'll let you scrutinize the rest of the radiograph for a moment. Okay, turning to the correlative imaging, spiculated lesion in the apex on CT, on the MR imaging. The second lesion seen well on the CT in the costophrenic sulcus, I think would very, be very difficult to identify prospectively on the MR imaging study. Now, I'd like to just briefly point out some work in progress. And the MR is clearly changing technologically very rapidly. And that I'm very optimistic that MR will become much, much more effective in evaluating the lung parenchyma. As you know, MR currently gives very poor depiction of both normal parenchyma and small focal abnormalities. Motion is a problem. That's probably why that big lesion by the costophrenic sulcus uh, was invisible being bumped out, if you will, by the diaphragmatic motion. Secondly, large susceptibility differences exist in the lung and wipe out signal, uh, particularly from gradient reversal techniques, but also from spin echo studies. Now, what we're developing at Stanford, this is work being done in conjunction with the Department of Electrical Engineering, John Pauley, Professor Mikowski, and in our department, Colleen Bergen, is to use very short TE times to image the lung to, manage, to minimize susceptibility problems. Now this may have a tremendous impact on MR evaluation of the lung, perhaps not so much in staging lung cancer, but as we screen for metastatic disease, et cetera. Here's a conventional spin echo image in this patient. And note, this is essentially a first generation of this method. Uh, what's happened, uh, the very short TE time, minimize susceptibility, much of the fine detail of the lung can be appreciated. We've come a long ways from this particular image, and I'm very encouraged by this, and I suspect within a couple years, these sorts of techniques will make MR quite efficacious in imaging the parenchyma.
Now, a potential advantage, actually, as the UC group pointed out a couple years ago, this is a problem we have every day in practice. Not so much, again, in the lung cancer patient, but looking for metastatic disease. The central nodule versus the vessel. I'll leave the slide up on your right so you can find the central nodules. And if this were coming through the stack, rule out metastatic disease, uh, you might have a problem with this one. Uh, indeed, here, the, we were lucky. This actually wasn't the patient that we were ruling out metastatic disease. A study was done for another indication. But they had two calcified nodules here. And I just use it to point out, now we can look back. Oops. And I think you can see here, as well as there, that central nodules are very difficult to distinguish uh, from blood vessels. And using the MR techniques, I think that we will be able to make this distinction in the future. In terms of rigorous data, MR versus CT for mediastinal node evaluation, we did a study a few years ago in the subcarinal region. Joel Platt was the primary author at Michigan. We really found little difference between MR and CT, both considerably better to AP tomography. Um, I think there are specific sites in which one modality may be a little better than the other. Currently, CT is a little better for distinguishing between a subcarinal node and esophagus. CT is better for closely positioned mediastinal nodes because of image blur on MR. Both of these are not inherent problems to the MR method, but should be obviated with technological advances. Uh, just a couple of demonstrations of it. Here you can very clearly see a few different nodes in through here, separated by fat. You can see they're blurred together here. And so that if there were three nodes there instead of two, you might reach an abnormal size. Now it also means um, and I don't know if this has been published yet, but the size criterion one has to use when evaluating MR images is slightly different than on CT. The nodes appear bigger on MR, maybe because of motion, um, and it's probably give a few millimeters more on the MR examination. Now, if this were all we had, it'd be probably say, well, this is a big subcarinal nodal mass, and in fact, most of it is, but some of that is esophagus. And so that because of the problems, in obtaining rapid MR images, if you're worried about things like hiatus hernia, et cetera. In this particular location, I found CT a little bit better. Now, MR would make a major contribution in staging the lung cancer patient if it could characterize lymph nodes based on relaxation times. So if benign nodes could be distinguished from malignant lymph nodes by differences in T1 and T2 times, MR would be of major value. About two years ago, we concluded a study with the thoracic surgeon Mark Oringer and ourselves while I was at Michigan, looking at relaxation times from excised mediastinal lymph nodes. And we've looked at a large number, almost 100 benign nodes and about 16, actually 16 malignant nodes. And indeed, the T1 times four malignant nodes were longer than four benign nodes. The T2 times four malignant nodes were larger also than four benign nodes. And this reached statistical significance for the T1 time. Now, I'm showing this in some detail, not only because of its application here, but because as you read the literature, looking at things like MR relaxation time data in myocardial infarction, et cetera, it's important to point out that even though things may reach statistical significance, the statistical significance is between the mean of these values. And it does not mean that you can immediately extrapolate this and say this is going to be useful for clinical decision making. I'll take this same data here and put it in histogram form and note the negative nodes in black, the positive nodes in white. There's no way we're going to be able to use this data for clinical decision making. And again, as you evaluate the MR data that comes out with quantitative values, I think you ought to insist upon this being depicted <coughs> in histogram form because if you just look at p-values, you get into these types of statements pertinent to statistics. Now, I think one can ask, can CT or MR be used to assess local features of invasiveness which determine whether a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy will be required? David talked to you earlier about evaluating the bronchi. I will say in this setting, one of the problems in using CT, more of a problem even in using MR, relates to extent of disease. How close 
does the tumor extend to the main stem bronchus. And so the information certainly is complementary between bronchoscopy and CT. One of the things that I think is very interesting, though, that the bronchoscopist has no handle on at all, does tumor involve the central pulmonary arteries or veins? And at times, that can be very, very difficult to determine on axial CT tomograms. I think that we have a potential for doing better. I'll just show you one example. Here, the tumor stuck out in the right hilum. 